treatment of medically refractory epilepsy. So getting an FDA approval is not something that happens every day and having one of those in your career is, is, a, is a great thing. Um, I would say across this time, I've had the fortune to live in, in a number of different countries. And although I've stayed with Medtronic for about 25 years, um, within that time, I've had the opportunity to move uh, geography, to move business, and to move uh, role or function that I've been doing. So I've really um, had the chance to make a lot of, of moves um, whilst staying under the Medtronic umbrella. So why do I think that this panel is really interesting in the topic of uh, the future of surgery and therapy? I'm very much on the therapy side. You won't hear a lot of um, surgical stuff from me today. But I really think that on the therapy side, the work that we're doing at the moment in the field of bioelectronic medicine is hugely exciting and important. Um, just to give a definition of, of what I mean by that, um, Bioelectronic medicine, the application of electricity or, or electrical stimulation to a really broad array of different diseases or disorders, um, whether of the central nervous system or of the peripheral um, systems and organs. And the idea that you're not just stimulating um, a specific nerve or a specific target, but you're, you're harnessing the natural processes and responses of the body um, in order to, to take part in that, um, in that uh, therapeutic process. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. Um, there is a huge amount of interest in the bioelectronic medicine. It's also called electroceuticals. There's interest from the device players uh, like ourselves and also from the pharma players. So the, uh, on the top of the right-hand side, the Galvani being a sort of a joint venture from GlaxoSmithKline, obviously a huge pharma player, and then Verily coming from the, um, from the, the computing and the, um, from the side of things. Um, that's a very important player. There are also, sort of entries coming in from biotech and then a number of companies that you see at the bottom which are sort of device based or, or, or medtech players that have interest in specific technologies or therapies um, in in the bioelectronic space and just on the left hand side um, some of the some of the numbers that get thrown around about the sort of accessible markets and, and what revenues could be expected if, if we were to have successful therapies um, in some of these places. So what's our approach? I, I work in the neuromodulation business uh, within Medtronic and in the disease states that we treat today, you see on the left-hand side, those that we treat with stimulation are doing, so for example, spinal cord stimulation for chronic pain, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease and also for epilepsy. So that's where we are today. But looking at bioelectronic medicine, we're asking ourselves, which disease states uh, should we be considering? With, with everything that bioelectronic can offer, there are you know, more than 100 disease states that we could look at and, and think about the application of electrical stimulation. So we're trying to work out which ones should we consider, which ones should we evaluate further, and then beyond that, what therapies do we want to deliver? What is what is the, the actual embodiment or, or sort of the, the form factor of the therapy look like? And then how do we deliver them to be successful? So the work that the, the team that I'm in, which is um, just formed a few months ago, the work that we're doing at the moment is really to to, to, to lay out a landscape of disease states and then through a series of questions, try and address which are the, the, the few areas that we really want to focus on and develop new stimulation therapies and, and bring to market um, in this space. So a um, lot more to talk about there, but um, that's the introduction for now and, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks.
Thank you so much for that introduction, Annabelle. Um, so if you could continue with Arvind. Hey, thank, thanks everyone. Uh, can you guys hear, hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, Arvind Ramadore. Uh, I'm based in Boston um, um, here in the US. And uh, uh, I'm currently a Senior Director of Global Marketing with the Surgical Robotics and the Digital Surgery Business. Um, and uh, uh, I can, again, give you a quick uh, summary of uh, my journey uh, since LBS. Um, so uh, I uh, originally, before LBS, uh, I got my uh, uh, engineering degree in electronics and communication in India. Then I came to the US to Washington University for a PhD. Uh, uh, then I got my MBA at the London Business School. and. Uh, um, since, and then I moved back to Boston um, after that, and I've been here since. And uh, my first uh, role out of uh, LBS was uh, working for a management consulting firm called PRTM in their out of their Boston office. Uh, uh, they're now part of PwC. They used to have an office in I think Oxford in the UK as well. Uh, we, we did a lot of work uh, in product development, supply chain operations, business planning, and so on. Um, and after that, I've had... Uh, uh, I, I moved back into more of an industry position and mostly I've been uh, operating at the intersection of strategy, innovation and marketing and, and driving entrepreneurial activities in big companies. So, so I work for a company called Lojack, uh, which is an auto security company uh, in the UK. It's known as Tracker. It's a sort of stolen vehicle recovery system. It's basically the same service or product that's offered there in a different brand name. Uh, and then... Uh, I work for iRobot, the, the company that makes the Roomba, uh, helping them enter the healthcare space. And I worked with uh, Honeywell uh, with their uh, digital home monitoring business. And then I joined Covidian, uh, which was uh, acquired by uh, Medtronic uh, about five, six years ago. And uh, so I've been with Covidian Medtronic pretty much the last eight years. And uh, specifically, uh, I've been working in uh, an incubator uh, for surgical robotics business. It was, think of it as a startup within uh, the former Covidian. That's how we started and uh, we operated as a startup uh, for quite a long time. Um, and uh, so uh, really the, uh, the, the, the main driver for Covidian and Medtronic to be uh, getting into this space is really there are, there are a lot of challenges in surgery and medical care in general, but uh, to two of the biggest uh, um, challenges is uh, really around, one is, uh, you know, surgery is still, there's a lot of art in surgery. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to take the, the artistry out and make it more skill-based that can be trained and eventually be able to reduce variability in the surgical process and outcomes. Um, and... Uh, also make surgery as minimally invasive as possible. So, which means the minimal trauma to the patient, faster recovery and so on. So the, these, these are the two big problems in surgery and, and, and robotics plays a big part in addressing those two. And the picture that you see is the Hugo robot, which uh, you, you can actually find quite a bit of information now about the robot. That's the product that uh, uh, I was, I've been working on uh, uh, for, good part of the last eight years. Uh, and uh, it's uh, being launched as we speak. Uh, um, and uh, the, so, so uh, that is uh, what I've been doing. Uh, but uh, just, I just wanted to give you guys a bigger uh, picture of, uh, uh, this is a very, very uh, a, a space that is very popular now for investment. Uh, if you take the human body, and almost every part of the human anatomy, there is a robot being contemplated to do something, okay? And I'm sure some companies have been left out. Uh, just there are 84 companies somebody had compiled uh, recently. Uh, and uh, for example, in Spine, uh, where Medtronic is a big player, with a, after we acquired a company called Mazor, uh, there are at least five other big companies, four other big companies doing uh, ro robot uh, assisted devices, uh, 
restoration of hair, there's a, there's a robot today. And uh, the, the, there is uh, general, general robots, there's cardiac robots, uh, kidney robots, robots aimed at the lung, uh, at the ENT and so on and so forth, and the abdomen. And uh, so it's a very fertile area of innovation. A lot of investment have gone in. Uh, it's, it's not a market easy to penetrate. Uh, it's, it's a high capital intensive uh, uh, space. In spite of that, it's uh, attracted a lot of companies. And primarily because uh, I think there are big problems to solve. And whenever you put a digital or a robotic interface between uh, the, uh, the surgeon and the patient, uh, you have a pretty good chance of removing all the, the things that drive variability. And so that's the concept. So to think of uh, the robot actually playing, uh, uh, the, the analogy I can give you is driverless cars. Um, so eventually surgery will uh, progress along the trajectory of driverless cars. Um, and this is just another view uh, of the, the same market uh, by just another view of taxonomy of the, the space. The, the biggest, uh, Robotic surgery space is really in what we call general surgery or soft tissue robotics, uh, which is where we play, the, the robot I showed you, uh, uh, followed by orthopedic neuro and spine. Uh, but this is an area to watch for the next 20 years. There's gonna be a lot of innovation and uh, really high growth uh, in, in, in this market uh, to improve surgery um, across all disciplines. So that's uh, just an introduction. Great. Thank you very much, Arvind, for that. It's really interesting. So can we continue with Brian, please? Yeah, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Arvind Annabelle, thank you for uh, giving me a, 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 a welcome preamble because it feeds in quite nicely to what we're going to talk about a little bit later on with, with Proximy, the company I work for. But again, thank you for inviting me to talk and uh, look forward to the questions afterwards. Uh, my, I haven't got any slides, so I'm going to uh, share with you um, my sort of career pathway, um, and as a guest of London Business School, I did my, my MBA not too far up the road, um, which I'll talk about. But my, my background is very much growing up in the operating room. So I was one, I am one of those um, individuals that 20 years ago, uh, which many people don't know still happens, is one of the salespeople from uh, a med device company spends tens of thousands of hours, if not hundreds of thousands of hours, in the operating room uh, helping teaching, educating, guiding, selling uh, to the surgeons and to the theatre teams to enable them to be able to use the equipment in the most effective way. So that's where I started after doing my undergrad degree. Uh, and I grew up in a very linear way through that trajectory. So you go to first line management and then you go to marketing and then you could do some product management. Then you might do some operations. I don't have the history of traveling the world like Annabelle does. I didn't get to go all, to, all the amazing places around Europe. I mainly stayed in the UK at first for mine. I did have a, a small time in Zurich, uh, which was absolutely wonderful in, in my career. But I, I did that. And when I became, I, I reached the giddy heights of middle management in uh, when I was about 32, 33, when I was um, running the UK business. It was around a business I know valued at about $100 million. There were sort of 100 people in it and so on, second, third line management. And I was really disappointed when I got there of how little I could affect change in the levers that I could affect within that corporate organization. I worked with Stryker at first, short time with Jane Jane, mainly with Smith and & Nephew. And I was at Smith & Nephew for 12, 13 years and they were great. All three were great companies to work for. But Smith & Nephew, when I was there in that role, I was disappointed. So I, I thought, I'll, what, what do I do? And my career path then took me to an MBA. So I assessed a number of MBAs um, and ended up going to Warwick Business School just up the road. But when I went, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to address. and. Um, I'm, I'd be delighted if, no, if you read nothing else that's out there right now or, or hear nothing else from me. There was a seminal paper written based on research in 2011, 2012 called and published in 2013 called Are You Still Deploying Milkmen in a Megastore World? And it spoke about the med device and med tech industry as a whole. And this paper, excuse me, just talks around how the commercialization models uh, that existed in the day and existed in the medical device companies are um, outdated compared to other industries that were progressing at a fast space, such as IT, particularly around after the, um, the, the crash in the late 2000s. 
So there was that paper, and, and really it was repeated with version two in 2017, and nothing really changed in that time, and it was disappointingly slow. And in my career, having done my MBA, and my MBA was focused on dig digital um, technologies and business model innovation around medical devices, particularly in orthopedics, uh, particularly focused in Europe, and how digital technologies could be deployed across the value chain of surgery. And when I talk about the value chain of surgery, what I mean is when you were referred as a patient to the acute hospital, so when you need a hip or knee replacement or maybe a cataract or whatever the operation is, right the way through your treatment pathway to the end point when you're discharged, and then at the end of it, you go back into your, to your primary care physician. So my job within Smith & Nephew, when I came back from finishing my part-time MBA, um, was looking at how we could partner, acquire, uh, distribute a uh, joint venture with different digital technologies um, and deploy them in different parts of the world globally. It was a fantastic role. It was a corporate entrepreneurship role. And it was one where I had a good, you know, safe haven of a corporate budget and a corporate environment. We were a small team, totally disassociated and separate from the core business. And what this, this meant that I didn't have the burdens and the, and the pressure of the core business but we could apply different compliance rules, different contracting rules, where we recognize revenue, what the tax implications were, how we marketed it, how we positioned, what we messaged. Writing a blog in a med device company or tweeting in 2013, 14, 15 was unheard of. Even now the processes within a med device company are very robust um, to enable you to have that freedom. And it was a wonderful role that was then. We acquired a couple of companies, startup companies in the workflow space one of which has been acquired recently, 12 months ago, by, uh, by Medtronic in digital surgery, and a couple of others that have since been acquired by the likes of Smith & Nephew and J&J &J that I worked with back, back then. And towards the end of my time then at Smith & Nephew, which was 2017, I started getting the, the aspiration and the itch really to work on the startup side. So I took the plunge at the end of 2017 to leave the court, safe haven of the corporate world with its constraints and with its... Um, the politic that exists with it and within all of the comfort and safety that it gives you and the aspiration it gives you. They're wonderful companies, which gave me a wonderful basis for my career. Um, so I was, I was 40 at the time, a ripe old age at 40 when I left the corporate world. Um, and for me, I wanted to work in the startup environment. So um, I tried to get three or four different companies to work together from the startup side, but working with 20 venture capitalists and 10 founders is very challenging to try and get them to align on anything. It reminded me again of a corporate world with the different business units. And that was clearly not my forte. So I ended up working in, and going to digital surgery, a company based in London, uh, originally known as Touch Surgery, uh, designed uh, and founded by four uh, surgeons in the UK. Um, one of which offered me the opportunity to invest in them back in 2013. And clearly not having any money at the time, uh, I didn't take the option to do that, but I wish I had known or, or hearing the rumors of what they sold out to, to Medtronic later on in the, in the time last year. So I worked for them when they were pivoting after their Series B fundraise. I think they raised around 25, 30 million dollars and they were pivoting away from their touch surgery platform, which was an app based platform, gamification platform of surgical techniques through to a broader platform in digital surgery and how we could bolt together different technologies that they were aspiring to build and deliver to drive value across that value chain of surgery. So what difference does it make to the patient, the hospital, the supply chain provider? And just to give you some indication of this, 40% of the cost of an implant in the US is tied up in the supply chain, the inefficiency of supply chain. So if you've done your operations management module, are you going to do it? And you look at just-in-time management and the Kanban and the Kaibans and the different processes that exist, you look at that and that, that inefficiency is huge. And why is it in the US, for example, the medical device companies charge $5,000 for an implant, when in the UK it's $1,500 and in Australia it's $10,000. There's a variation in outcome, there's a variation in pricing, and there's a variation ultimately in care. So depending where you live, depends on the outcome you receive and the quality of treatment you receive. And that was really important to me when I was looking in from, the, I was working on the inside and then as I left, a digital surgery, that was one of their aspirations. And my role was to help them with their commercial model back in 2017, 2018, and plan out for the number of years what their commercialization model, and maybe one or two exit options that they had further down the line. Um, having been there only for a few weeks, I uh, saw Dr. Nadine Hashash Haram, an entrepreneur through the NHS Entrepreneurship Programme. She was presenting on the BBC uh, between Christmas 2017 and 2018. 
and she was talking about variation in surgery. And it reminded me of all of the time I spent in the operating room back in my early career, where I see great, I've seen great surgeons do amazing things. I've also seen further surgeons do less amazing things. And why is it that that variation in care, that if, you, if, you, if you're in Tennessee you've, and a zip code in Tennessee, you don't have access to many, as many pediatricians and pediatric surgeons as you do if you're in Boston? Why is that okay? And why is it okay that this variation occurs? Because the expertise of surgery occurs in different places. And it occurs in different places, much like the same quality of teaching, much like the same quality of business, is because of the location of people and how they locate and how they interact. So what Nadine Haram, Dr. Nadine Haram, who's a, currently a, a plastic surgeon, who's, who's operating and still a full-time full plastic surgeon, she's head of innovation, clinical innovation at Guy's and St. Tommy's in London, by far the biggest hospital in the UK. I think their revenue is, is over $4 billion. She wanted to address this problem. So as I say to everyone, I stalked her a little bit too much on LinkedIn back in 2018. It probably made her a little bit uncomfortable when I was trying to get in touch with her, really asking her and willing her to say, look, I can help you, I can help. I understand your problems. I understand the business. I understand the space of surgery, let me help. And eventually she replied and we met up in London back in early 2018. And, and three years later, I still work at Proximia. I'm now the global marketing officer for Proximy. Um, and we've uh, developed our product over those three years with really commercializing in 2019, uh, growing um, exponentially in a hyper growth stage. You might, might say we're, we've gone from zero to over 300 hospitals. We do, we've done over 10,000 procedures. We're in over 40 countries. We work with 40, over 40 medical device companies, including Medtronic, which I'll come on to in a minute, um, uh, not withstanding our NDA um, and what I can, I cannot say with Medtronic, but from our side um, now what and what Proximy does and really why I'm so passionate about Proximy and, and why I'm part of it and I want to be part of the legacy of something bigger than I could influence within a corporate is that what we do is connect surgeons from all over the world to share their expertise in real time in surgery using a combination of different technologies including advanced telecoms, which means we can work off 3G connections or wireless four or five megabytes per second connections. And we can stream four or five different video streams from every surgery to anywhere in the world and have multiple people dialing in either to learn from or to teach others how to do surgery. So for example, when medical device companies launch, maybe let's say a new robot, let's say the robot's called Hugo and they're launching that product. Obviously when they launch the product, or any product in this space, or any med device launches the products, they want to ensure that, that product is used correctly and is used really effectively to give the best patient outcomes. And what Proximy does, for the med device industry at least, is connect experts together to ensure that those patients receive the best care possible. They also record that content, so you can use it for data analytics and you can use it for further teaching and learning for the community as well. And we do this across the world and we do this for a number of different organizations. We provide it for free to many trainees, surgical trainees in the UK to enable them to give some self-directed learning and to join surgeries in the UK because after COVID, as you know, the challenge with surgical training is very difficult to get access into the operating room. And part of Nadine's premise and why she exists and why Proxima exists and why we're all passionate about what we do is to enable that equal opportunity to care, equal opportunity to learning for everyone in the world. So our ambition is to get to 300 million surgeries to be in every operating room in the world. And that's what we'd like to do and like to achieve. So we have a philanthropic business. We work in Mali, Kenya, Algeria, Ethiopia, for example. But we also work in London, Boston, New York, LA, Stanford University, uh, you know, et cetera, all over the world. Because the problem, and I'll finish on this, the problem that exists is the same problem that if you injure your hand in London, and you go to Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, you're going to get different care than if you go to West Middlesex Hospital, yet they're, same, they're the same NHS trust. It's the same if you go to Stamford, it's the same in New York, it's the same in Peru. And me growing up in Wales, a rural part of the UK, one of the few countries in Europe without even electric railways, but we have lots of castles and maybe that's indicative of the Welsh economy and the Welsh, in, Welsh country. You know, we don't get the same opportunity to care and there's no reason why that should happen anywhere in the world. So that's an indication of my sort of career path and what I'm doing now. Happy to share more. I've got some videos of how Proxima works and so on. Um, and I'll just finish that we've just closed our Series B round last week. We announced a $38 million investment into Proxima with some uh, US investors, uh, F Prime, 
Maverick and uh, Questa to go along with our current investors. So we're at the stage now that we're recruiting actively um, and interested in, in having talented people join our organization. And I would say that probably the best jobs are the ones not advertised. So if anyone's interested or knows other people, please get in touch. We'll be delighted to explain more. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and happy to take any questions and share all of my mistakes along the way. So you, maybe some of you guys don't have to experience the same scars and trauma that I did on that journey. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction. And hopefully we'll get the time to go through the resources that you mentioned. Um, so now uh, what we're going to do, we're going to open the floor to questions for about 30 minutes. And then afterwards, we are going to divide our speakers into breakout rooms for some informal uh, networking sessions. And uh, you can talk about recruitment there uh, with Brian or others if you wish to. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hands virtually and I will call on you and you can ask your question. We also have some pre-submitted questions that I'll try to get in if we have the time. I was hoping Carl would ask a question, um, hopefully not about rugby. Carl and I shared a stage some time ago talking about uh, Salesforce effectiveness and, and digital technologies, but uh, I'm not sure if Carl's around uh, as well, but I'll put him on the spot if he doesn't ask a question. Uh, Sam? Yeah, thank you for, I mean, the three of you for uh, giving such insightful perspective on the set of the industry. I mean, it's great that you're all working within the same, you know, medtech sector, but like different kind of streams. So that was really interesting. I had a question for um, Annabelle. I think in the, the last slide you had, you, you had like a kind of a funeral diagram with uh, the different stage uh, and the different question you're asking yourself at each one of the stage. And, um, and for the kind of like the, the tip, the bottleneck of your funeral, one of the questions you had was, um, th does Medtronic has the right to win? And I was wondering what, what you meant by that, basically, because it seems like quite a weird thing, I guess, you ask yourself. Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, thanks, Sam. And the, the right to win, um, I, I'm not sure that that's my favorite phrase, um, the way to say it, the way that, that I think about it is, is there um, a disease state and a technology application that has, um, where we have synergies um, that would put us at a significant advantage if we would enter that space with that technology. So if you think about, um, for example, one of the areas that we look at um, in, in terms of neuromodulation is um, as a therapy for stroke rehabilitation. So seven hundred thousand strokes per year in the US. Um, many can be successfully treated if they get to hospital in time in an acute setting to dissolve the clot or remove the clot. But um, you know. Many go on to have uh, an anesthesia or, or you know, other types of paralysis. And, and so the, re the rehabilitation part is, um, is critical. What could neurostimulation, either invasive or non-invasive, do in that rehabilitation setting? The fact that Medtronic has a very strong business in the acute stroke arena, so in the removal of clots, would mean that if we then thought about a therapy in the rehabilitation area, we already have a call point, which is the stroke um, care center. We already have knowledge in that disease state earlier in the care pathway, but it's something that we can build onto. So we might consider that we have compared to another med tech player that might have equivalent technology, but no existing stroke um, presence. We might have more of a right to them. So that's just one example. Um, you know, there would be plenty of others, but it's that type of thing. So, so just to make sure I understand well, it's, there's also some consideration about not cannib cannibalizing your own market, right? If you already have your own kind of a, if you already have- I mean, Potentially, I mean, we, if, if there is a, a technology that is significantly more efficacious, um, that has a, has a sort of more tolerable by patients, um, you know, patients prefer it, then 
yeah, that would be the right thing to do to go ahead and capitalize your own therapy. And, 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 we, and we do that and we have done that. Um, and that and that could be another example of a, of a right to win. It's like we're already leading in that area and we come out with something that is that is better. Um, so it could be that. Thank you. Can I, can I, Sam, just to follow up there? Well, um, it's really interesting. It, you know, you, you can go laterally, a little bit laterally in that vertical you're in. So you're going laterally across that patient journey almost and working out across that patient journey. So you can have the cradle to grave strategy, if you like, um, of that patient. Forgive the term. It's, uh, you know, when you look at orthopedic companies, you've got orthopediatrics, which work in, in children, clearly. And then you have the major plays as they grow. But where does that transition from a child to an adult in terms of age of treatment and treatment options? So extending that journey um, for your strategy and where that goes, as well as um, across each patient's journey laterally, if you like pre-op, post-op is, is, mm -mm, is a strategy that, that yeah, absolutely makes sense and with expertise in that space is really interesting. The question I've got, I suppose, is from the from Medtronic side of things or any of us in this business is how you know, that preventative side of things. You know, there's no money in, in, you know, stopping people get cancer for the pharmaceutical companies. So, and, and I know from a value-based healthcare, Medtronic have been at the forefront with Omar Israq in the past about that value-based and, and passionate about that as well. So how do you see that complementing? Yes, you can treat after the fact, but what about sort of pre, prehab um, or that pre-case so people don't need surgery and we don't need um, the next generation? Um, of, of implants? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a, a good example of where we're playing right now to try and... Sorry, I don't know the answer either. That's why I was curious to... No, no but I think, you know, that the idea of the care pathway and, I mean, our, our, our background is in, is in treating chronic disorders and trying to, trying to have an intervention or a therapy that will either prevent that condition from deteriorating or, you know, restore health, alleviate pain and extend life. That, that's the, the sort of the, the mission of what we do. Um, you know, if we can get earlier and earlier in the care pathway with, with new technologies, I mean, that's one thing, but to get all the way up to detection or prevention before you even detect, um, I'd say, so the therapy areas that I have worked in, um, we have tended to be at quite the other extreme. We, we've been at, you know, take brain stimulation. It, it's been seen as a therapy of last resort for Parkinson's disease. You've already gone all the way through pharma and all the, all the different options of, of sort of dopamine or dopamine agonists. So from, from where we have come with deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's to being at the preventive end, it's, it's kind of a very long journey for us and, and, and we're, not, we're not necessarily all the way back to the beginning. Thank you, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer, it's conundrum. Thank you, Brian and Annabelle for your answer and question. Uh, Mariam? Hi, I had a question for Annabelle. Uh, so I'm myself quite interested in neurological disorders and I was trying to understand how strong the bioelectronics field is at the moment. So based on the results that you've gotten, do you think it's something that might um, potentially replace the quite limited treatments that we have for, uh, for example, neurodegenerative disorders? Or do you think, um, do you think that it's not there yet? Or um, if yes, would it be more of a curative approach or is it going to be more of a uh, preventative approach? Thanks. Great question, Mariam. Um, I think my answer is a kind of a sum of each. I, I, I certainly think that bioelectronic medicine will bring some game changers. Um, I don't know in which disease states, um, and I don't know when, but I think that there is a convergence of, um, there's, there's a convergence of interests. It's sort of, 
research interest in the area, industry um, interest, and not just med tech in, uh, interest, but you know, digital interest and um, government sort of also wanting to, to sort of expand the field for, for their own sort of healthcare systems. So, so I think that it's, it's an area of high interest, high visibility and, and a lot going on. So I, I think that there will be great breakthroughs, but as I say, I can't say in one disease state as opposed to another. When it comes to degenerative disorders, um, could we think of bioelectronic solutions that could reverse the course? Uh, we talk about disease modifying. Um, so let's think about Alzheimer's disease um, as one of the most sort of large areas of unmet need, um, degenerative. There is nothing on the market today which will reverse the course of the Alzheimer's disease. I think it's, I think it's, I, I think I would be foolish to say we could get to a disease modifying therapy in Alzheimer's. Um, I, I think that there are, you know, certainly the, the objective is out there to, to try and achieve that. Um, but I think it's too early to say whether we can. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Annabelle. Uh, also, to everyone, uh, you can also type your questions in the chat and uh, we'll read them out. Uh, Sam, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I had a question for Arvind, because, um, uh, I mean, one of your slides kind of like, you know, like caught my attention with you showing, you know, the human body and basically all the different companies having, you know, robots that could, you know, operate those organs and you had like, you know, lots of them. I'm just wondering in terms of uh, like your, your own kind of like portfolio of robots, are they, I mean, could you use the same robot to basically operate different organs or is it like, you know, such a, you know, complicated specific bespoke robot for each organ? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, the short answer is, uh, he, he, as the technology stands today, uh, the, the robots are very indication specific. Uh, what I mean is indication is a technical word for, you know, a robot is indicated treating a certain disease. Um, and so, uh, and, uh, so every robot is, is, is different uh, uh, because of what it needs to do. And uh, uh, the anatomical, features that it has to contend with. Uh, so uh, let me give you kind of uh, three paradigms in, in robotics today that, that kind of exist. So uh, what is a completely automated robot, right? Uh, and, 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 and all robots don't look the same, right? Uh, the, uh, th there's really very few robots that, that does the task of intervention automatically. Uh, one of that is the head transportation robot. Yeah, you know, think of it as the, the, it doesn't look like a robot with face and hands. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a robotic system and uh, it, it basically restores your hair. Um, and uh, it, it's automated, uh, which means it's, it's reprogrammable and programmable to a specific person. And it does the head transplant that is very specific to that person in an automated fa fashion and it's accurate repeatable, good quality, blah, blah, blah. Whereas the robot that I'm working on is more of a cooperative robot where it's pretty much like a driving a remote control car or a drone where uh, the robot carries the instrument into the patient through a bunch of holes. And one of them holds a camera and the other two service hands. And, and the surgeon is sitting away from the robot and teleoperating. It's a master slave. Uh, so it's not done automatically. There's no automation there. It's a surgeon in the loop. Uh, so, uh, the, and those robots are very different. They operate different. They solve a different set of problems. Um, the, the third kind of robots are more of robots that help you plan a surgery, which are called image-based robots. So those are for uh, some of the 
uh, more harder or bony organs, the skull, ortho, spine. Uh, so where you can take an image of the bony structures and, and plan the surgery as to where you want to put that screw or where you want to, go, how far you want to go into the brain uh, to take out a biopsy or a tumor. And the, the robotic system uh, helps you plan that and uh, uh, then allows for the surgeon to accurately access it, but always in surgeon control. Uh, so depending on the application, the, the robot is very different, the use case is very different, and the extent to which the, the machine and, the, and the, the surgeon cooperate is very different. So they're all very different. Uh, it, it's almost procedure or anatomy specific. Okay, I have like, yeah, two follow-up question based on what you just said. The, the first one is like, uh, I know there's a lot of, you know, AI, um, you know, algorithm that basically can help you. Um, so if, as you said, you know, uh, you know, help planning surgery, predict what's going to happen if you, um, I don't know if you cut tissue here, what's going to happen, for example. But in the second example, so I think that's the one you, you're working on. Uh, I know that, for example, when it comes to uh, ablation of uh, tissue in the, the left atrium to kind of like, uh, you know, take care of atrial fibrillation, um, we have like, you know, robots that kind of, uh, you know, you get like an AI system that kind of uh, identify the, the tissue that should be cut and then the doctor get, I mean, the surgeon get the final say on whether or not to cut that tissue. Is that something you're working on? And what is the place of AI in, your, in, your, in the robots you're working on? Yes, uh, I think, uh, I, well, I'm not working on that specific robot for that, uh, uh, but, but a robot uh, such as the one that uh, I work on um, could be made to do things like that uh, uh, in, the, in the cardiac space, but we don't do it today. So uh, the, uh, as far as the AI goes, <coughs> it's, uh, uh, it really varies. So uh, for example, uh, AI is used in planning a surgery. So what that means is suppose you need a, a, a kidney tumor taken out, right? Everyone's kidney and the vasculature is very different. And uh, so if a surgeon really wants to plan, the, uh, and normally almost every cancer uh, is detected through imaging, right? And the imaging is two dimensional slices and, and surgeon kind of makes the mapping from those seeing those on the screen to what the real world because of experience. But what AI allows you to do is it allows you to go and reconstruct that very personalized organ for that person. Look at the vasculature, the, the tumor, as well as where it is in relation to the kidney. And so that, for example, uh, there is a lot of variation in the vasculature. Some of them will have two branches of an artery. Some of them will have three. And by knowing that, uh, they can actually plan surgery better and at the end of the day, the outcome is going to be better. AI helps you to take those images and segment the images to those organs. So that's one way of using it. Uh, another way, so that is in the planning of the surgery. And when you're actually doing surgery, uh, there, there are a lot of things you can do wrong. And uh, uh, AI is good in recognizing patterns. Um, and so an algorithm can be trained to run in real time uh, uh, to, to be an assistance uh, to the surgeon, you know, like if you're, if you're driving your Tesla or, your, or, a, or even a Honda today, when you're driving on the road, you're on cruise control, and if you come too close to a car in front, it beats you. You know, uh, artificial intelligence can be used to implement things like that, so that when you go close to an organ that, that, sh that where you shouldn't be, or if you're close to injuring an organ, it alerts the surgeon or even blocks the surgeon from going there. Uh, with the tool. Uh, so you can do it intraoperatively. And then postoperatively, you can collect all this data and do aggregate analysis uh, and use that to predict future outcomes. So the AI is kind of an overlay uh, around the surgical process, uh, which is what we call digital assisted surgery. And it's really across the continuum of surgical care, AI plays a part, but it's still very early. I think the, the AI and this digital assistance for, uh, for medicine is probably the most advanced in kind of two areas, one in genomics um, and, and the other one is uh, radiology, imaging. Uh, they are much more advanced in that, but, but in, in real time surgery, uh, it, it's still in, uh, in very early stages, but very promising. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Arvind. I think Brain wanted to pitch in on this one as well. Yeah, I, this is a great topic, isn't it? And, and Arvind, I thought you captured it well. Um, I, I saw, a, you know, you see the GIF where, you know, machine learning for you, AI for you, a bit of this for you, you know, digital you know, computer vision for you. There's a lot of the terms being out there, you know, proximity ourselves, you know, we, we have an artificial intelligence element to it, which we're going through clinical trial now in, in, in of all places in Wales, just because uh, we got a, a big grant from Innovate UK to do that. But I think ultimately the value, there's two things, and, I, and I'm going to say this in, in, in a, um, to share with you something that, that when it doesn't work as well outside of clinical, but, um, you know, the value has to be to the user. There has to be a value. The radiology term that I've been spoke about is, is well-versed around detecting different cancers and breast cancers and teaching the machine to enable that artificial intelligence to function these big, broad, diverse data sets. And if you Google um, the racist soap dispenser, you will see a, um, re it's, it's, um, a really sad indication of, of, a, of a soap dispenser that only recognizes white people's hands. It's been designed on a data set with a algorithm that has been, that's got such a narrow data set. If you have a black hand and you put it underneath, it doesn't get dispense any soap. And there's a video clip of it and there's commentary around it talking about it. And they've labeled it obviously a racist soap dispenser, but clearly the soap dispenser is racist. It's just been set on a poor data set. So I think ultimately my point is that anything that's built in this through a machine learning and then a, you know, an AI algorithm needs a broad, diverse, high volume data set. And to do that, you need a global data set. And a part of the premise of Proxima is to be global. And it's really important to be global. We don't want to be just in the US, let's say the East and West Coast, because it doesn't even represent the US. You need that global data set to be able to do it. So ultimately having high volume, global inclusive data sets enable you to teach the machine to draw, to build an algorithm that then you can apply for whatever application you want, whether it be a robot, robotic surgery and digital assisted surgery, as I've been saying, said or something as simple in inverted commas as a soap dispenser. So I think there's considerations around ethical AI and the use of AI and the use of data for all of us, because we've all got the, our cognitive biases. We've all got all the data sets that we work to. And I think this goes on to how we recruit and how, you know, there's so many different things about diversity and inclusivity and cognitive bias and the applications that we use um, and the effect it can have on our society. So I think it's a really broad and fascinating topic, which clearly has a, as an acute application in healthcare in, in the segments that Arvin said and will only continue to grow. Genomics being another, I think, a great point. Thank you so, so much. Maybe a more philosophical question there. A discussion yeah. that there as well. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I have a question from Atalia for Brian. Proximity seems like it is bringing a much needed change to practice. What is the biggest challenge to wider adoption? It's a great question. So we, we existed, um, the idea, the Dean speaks of when she sat on the floor of an operating room on one of the stools that you can stand on on the operating room. She sat there watching a patient come in and a patient come out. And this was back in 2014. And she was, she was thinking, there's got to be more to it than me just doing patient after patient. I, I need to, there must be something bigger than doing this every day and, and having a limited impact, albeit positive impact. And we didn't commercialize till 2019. And clearly, um, We've been, if you like, fortunate because of the situation with COVID and the adoption of digital technologies. We've seen on LinkedIn, I'm sure everyone's seen the post, where there's an image and a cartoon drawing and it says, who affected digital transformation in your organization? CEO, no. CFO, no. COO, no. Chief Commercial Officer, no. COVID, yes. And how COVID has enabled organizations to be more and more comfortable or alternatively forced organizations to be uncomfortable with affecting change. And, you know, you can go and read about the boiling frog and uh, the, you know, uh, whose cheese, it, um, who moved my cheese and all these, but cotter and the iceberg is melting. All of these things about affecting change and organizational change. The biggest barrier we had and we saw was that medical device companies and hospitals were using us a little bit pre-COVID sort of depending on different geographies and need and business units. And during COVID, we saw three reactions and actually Nadine's done a talk on this, it's fascinating. We saw three reactions. We saw the, the, the freeze response where everyone just stood still and went, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. I'm not gonna do anything. And we're just gonna wait and look like rabbits in the headlights. 
we saw people say, actually, we can afford to, especially the bigger players could afford to say, well, we're going to run with a new way of doing things. And if it doesn't work, we can burn $100 million on this process and still go back to the old way and be okay with it. And then we saw others saying, well, you know what, I, I'm going to bury my head in the sand and think that COVID's going to go away in two weeks and it'll be fixed by Easter, uh, not quoting anyone in particular, that, that it, would, it would disappear. And we saw that. And the thing that was really interesting, and Tali, thank you for the question, because we saw the same company with in different business units in the same geography approach this in a different way. So it was really interesting, that especially the major ones, you have different, and that was down to attitude, attitude, individual um, personalities maybe, and culture of that business unit and subculture of the business unit and how they would approach it. So I think um, the saying is, you know, it, it's amazing how many overnights it takes to become an overnight success. I think you've got to have, and, and the other quote is, you know, I'd rather be lucky than good. Um, I think timing is everything. I think that contributes to it. We also have to be in the right place at the right time to capitalize on that macroeconomic or macro environmental factor that happens to you. So um, definitely it's it's people and culture change first um, and that will give you the product market fit. And if you add value to the end user, as our end user being a surgeon, then um, you're a long way along the line, I think. I hope that answered the question, Natalia. Thank you for the answer, Brian. Uh, I think Annabelle wanted to push in on this as well. Yeah. Or is it just what's on the chat? I just, yeah, I was just adding to what Ben was talking about um, COVID having triggered a change more than the CEO or the CTO. Yes, I think a lot of change to organizations, but I was also saying that um, some of the healthcare systems have been forced to change as well, and that's for the good. Um, so patients not, having to, not being able to go to a hospital facility can still have um, follow-up visits by telehealth and that is now reimbursed. And that's a change that is probably unlikely to reverse once the pandemic is over. So just having them not being the same. Yeah, totally agree. It was, um, you know, the Republican Party moved pretty quickly to change the le legislation about cross-state legislation in the states and, and licensing share in the states. So surgeons and doctors could um, treat patients across state borders, which they couldn't do in the past. So they moved pretty quick on that, um, to all credit for the Republican Party in that time. So it's a great point. Right, thank you for that. Um, so as a last question from Jamie for Brian. You mentioned adopting a global approach. How do you plan to expand to under-resourced and low-income countries who would really benefit from this kind of technology? Yeah, Jamie, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first ever case of proximity between um, Riverside, California um, and, uh, and Peru for cleft palate reconstruction in children. So when it was built, Nadine went to um, Peru, she's been to Vietnam to do these mission work that lots of surgeons do across the world. And, Again, you have limited impact. So we knew that the, the solution needed to be accessible for everyone and affordable for everyone. So it works off at low bandwidth, it works off your laptop and a webcam that you can buy on you know, webcam from Amazon and you can integrate with, with a robot um, that's clearly millions and millions of dollars or $1 million in price, whatever the price point will be. So um, we wanted to make sure it worked like that. And for us now, we're working with different foundations um, and different organizations. There are global health organizations. We work with the UN, um, World Health Organization. They're the major philanthropic organizations that you would have heard of, Rockefeller um, and, um, and the Gates Foundation, et cetera. There's something called safesurgery.org um, who pull together different organizations. j, &J Foundation, um, Medtronic have one, uh, um, Intuitive, um, they have a foundation as well, all of which are looking to, to bring in a quality of opportunity of care um, in various different stages. And just to finish with this, or I'll nearly finish with this statistic, but ultimately that's who we work with. So we have um, um, a few people that work for us who are incredibly well versed at global health. And we want to address the global south, which is the terminology used now, uh, as I understand it, to address the inequality of care in emerging, or used to be emerging or developing markets. So right now we're hopefully, fingers crossed, signing a, an agreement and contract across um, a telecoms company, global telecoms company, a global medical device company, two or three major foundations in the US with places like uh, you know Harvard and John Hopkins and Columbia, they have these foundations. So it's a multi-party 
organization to bring safe surgery to the regions in Kenya. And um, we are having work streams to multiple different areas. And that's on the big scale. And on the small scale, for example, after the blast in Lebanon, we donated and deployed Proxmi into the hospitals in Lebanon. We, we didn't do any PR. We didn't do anything around it. We just deployed it to enable that, that care to be provided. And surgeries where you were reattaching, you're attaching a big toe to the hand to replace the thumb, not very common anywhere in the world. So we had to connect surgeons together. So if there's a call for anyone of any application, that you see Proxmi, and because it's relatively low cost, relatively accessible, we have a budget we put aside every year to be able to contribute to that. Clearly our pockets aren't quite as deep or nearly as deep as the likes of Medtronic and, and so on, but we try and do our bit uh, to align to those. And we also align to the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. We look at our customers and we've got those that represent our values as well. But I'll finish with this on surgery. And I don't know if this is a common stat, but the, the Lancet report came out a few years ago and spoke about 5 billion people not having access to safe surgery. So people will die from appendicitis, people will die from broken leg. So 5 billion people and 18.6 million people die every year from not having access to safe surgery. These are people who die. These aren't people who you know, don't have the optimum treatment. These are people who die. And just to give context, that is more than TB, malaria and HIV combined every single year. So that, that this problem is an annualized problem that's not going away anytime soon. And the money and resource and press that is associated with those diseases that I've mentioned far outweighs that to deliver safe surgery. So if it's something that is aligned to your, your view, and just, you know, an average US person will have surgery 9.2 times. I don't know what the point two is, but 9.2 times in their lifetime, they'll have surgery 9.2 times. And we're all affected by it, whether we like it or not, whether we plan for it or not. So having that access to safe surgery and care is, is vital everywhere. And just to give some further context for people in the US who think it's the faraway lands that the problem, there's a variation in care in the US, there is three, there's a three time variation care, not in surgery, but in clinical care between the top performing hospital and the bottom performing hospital. You are three times more likely to die after a complex trauma case in a lower performing hospital than if you're in a top performing hospital in the US. Barry Rosenberg said that he was a doctor and now works for Boston Consulting. So, you know, this variation care of care and variation of surgical care is the same everywhere. Um, and it's, if it's something you're passionate about, then get involved, whether it be a big, small, big small company it's really something that needs the bright minds of the future to work on so when we're affected by it we get the best care possible thank sorry, you for answering sorry about it no it's all right um i just had a quick question for Brian myself um you spoke of the challenges you encountered uh, during your expansion did you ever have any challenges regarding uh, data protection laws or regulations because you are technically sharing patient information potentially internationally we did yeah brexit didn't help uh, i'd say that um being having voted in that in that uh referendum so yeah absolutely um th there's let me try and be brief there's two or three things here that are consideration there's, there's data privacy and there is you know data security so if i i'll just address the privacy side of things gdpr is by far the uh, most advanced and complex and thorough protection given to citizens across Europe, including the UK, uh, that exists right now. And that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. So for us, yes, we have to comply with GDPR. In the US, you have the HIPAA regulations as well. And you can, you, you know, we do approximately comply with those. But again, each different market has slightly different nuances to those. So we need to ensure that we do it as a, a core value and a core part of our business. But it does make the the, the cost of, of doing business in different markets more expensive. A lot of companies just stay in the US, for example, because it's a homogenous market in the sense of data privacy and law, et cetera. Um, so yes, it's an absolute consideration and one that continues to evolve and change. And the, my comment about Brexit was because depending where your servers are and who runs your service, whether it be AWS, Azure, whoever it might be, um, as the law changes or becomes more and more ambiguous or people just don't know what the standard should be because of changes in you know, the macroeconomic or the political environment, then you have to adapt as a company. It doesn't make it harder for a smaller, less resource company to consider. And it's one that everyone is so ca cautious and um, about whether that be I send an email in marketing, whether that be the data we hold of surgery online. It's really something that is, um, is really important for us to consider.